I'm Alanis King with Jalopnik, and I'm at the iRacing headquarters outside of Boston, where racetracks get beamed into a video game so real that even professional racers use it to practice. iRacing is a paid subscription gaming service launched in 2008 as a way to give people a true-to-life racing simulator. But how do you create the most realistic racing sim possible? Aside from the coding that makes up the backbone of the game, you've got to nail the two most important elements, the tracks and the race cars. It all starts with the real thing, beaming a racetrack into a computer with some of the powerful technology iRacing has. I can pretty safely say I think we pioneered the use of laser scanners to, to build tracks. The Leica C10 scanner maps out the 3D space around it by shooting a laser and measuring how long it takes the beam to bounce back. It does this millions of times, so iRacing can bring a virtual map of the track back to the office. So the actual process of building tracks now is, from a technical standpoint, pretty easy because we have this really true authentic data that we can use to build the tracks. All of that data is compiled into a point cloud, which is definitely as cool as it sounds. iRacing then uploads that cloud into a track building program called Sandbox. The point cloud is literally what it sounds like. It's a cloud of points, little dots in space, but it is so dense and there's so many of them, millions and millions of points, that when you look at it, it looks like a solid surface. So we use that point cloud as a, a guide, as a reference, to put down those 3D geometry planes. The colors show different properties of different surfaces, all the way down to little details like painted lines. The color differences are then used to lay down geometry. So the track geometry is constantly looking at the point cloud underneath what I'm building and kind of affixing the surfaces that I'm making to the point cloud. Um, so that not only is it accurate when you line it up, but it's also accurate in terms of bumpiness. To help with that, the team also takes thousands of photos of a track scenery to recreate it, from concrete textures and guardrails to nearby buildings, statues, and trees. But visual details aren't the only thing that make iRacing's tracks realistic. You know, we build these tracks and until a few years ago, they were static. They didn't change during a race or whatever. And my project was to make the track dynamic, make it come to life so that it would change over the life of a race. It would take on marbles, it would take on rubber, dust, temperature, and soon to be water. And also soon to be what we call polish level, which is how worn in the track is at different points. This not only mimics what happens at real race tracks, but the server also makes sure everyone's version of a track is in sync when it comes to surface details. That means dust kicked up by one driver can affect another, and heat put down by tires will affect how a field races. You might see the field all running one line, but then that line kind of heats up. Some guys will start exploring up higher that, you know, in a static track that would be slower, but because the track is alive, now that low line has warmed up and it's not as grippy. But a good track is nothing without cars to race on it, and making them is a challenge that requires real-world engineering. We have a team of vehicle dynamics engineers that have all come from the real racing world. So, you know, Steve Rees has come from Penske, Eric Hudek has come from RCR, um, Chris Lurch has come from Formula One and sports car racing. So they know exactly what they need from the teams and the manufacturers to collect to be able to take back and put it into our model. iRacing tries to work closely with race teams for detailed data about their cars, but teams aren't always willing to share every secret. In the case of Scott Speed's Volkswagen Beetle, iRacing got everything they could have asked for and a driver to test it. Well, from the, from the very first steps of uh, the development of the Rallycross car, uh, myself and my race engineer, Graham Quinn, were really heavily involved. Um, Graham from a technical side, and you know, I spent a lot of time in the seat trying to both make it as realistic as possible and, and also as, as usable as possible, I guess. So in developing the Rallycross car, Andretti Autosports provided us with 
every bit of information that you would typically need to develop a vehicle model from their aerodynamic data to the powertrain data to the mass inertia data, uh, tire data, and we're able to take all of that information and plug it into the model. There was a lot of tuning even just back and forth between Scott and Graham and Tanner uh, and myself to, in order to get the cars correct. So, so the workflow um, w was quite easy for us because we'd spend hours on that uh, while I was in town uh, testing. Uh, and, and we'd come up with sort of a list of the things we'd want to change. We probably spent an additional four or five months just kind of in a con continuous feedback loop where I would update the car, make changes, they would try it, provide feedback. The change in the, and the development that happened from the very first car we tried to the, to the final product was massively different because not only are you messing with the physics of the car, but you're also messing with uh, sort of the durability of the car. Because unlike all the other cars in iRacing, this car has to land a jump. And so we really went back and forth trying to find basically the right amount of damage that would occur uh, in the car if you, you know, jumped too long or landed a jump wrong. iRacing, in that sense, is a never-ending task to make gaming simulation as real as possible. The website's cars and tracks are updated as iRacing learns more about them, allowing everyone else to learn more about them too. Only time will tell just how close they can get to the real thing.